Hello everyone, welcome to Open Source Code. This is our fifth video in the GNU slash Linux tutorial series. So this is the next video after the GNU slash Linux installation video. Hopefully most of you have already installed the Linux system and some of you have already explored it to the GUI mode. Probably some of you more enthusiastic might have dived into the command line interface also. So, what is this video about? In this video, we are going to look at the structure of the GNU slash Linux system, a bit of overview of it. As you will be shifting from some other operating system to this particular operating system, where you will find the things a bit different. So, let's get started. Before we proceed, I would like you to leave something behind. What is that? That would be FUD. What is FUD? Fear, uncertainty and doubts. If you leave this behind, it will be much more easier journey for you into the Linux environment. You have to leave the fear of where, whether I'll be able to learn the system or not. You have to leave your uncertainty behind. There, are, there is a lot of help. The Linux system has come to a point where it is very user friendly and you can use it. And doubts, you don't need to have any doubts. We are going to clarify those things. You just need to have an open mind that yes, you can learn it. If there is a will, there is a way. So one of the things that I have noticed with most of the people is that there is an unnecessary fear about the Linux system that you have to do everything on the command line. Well, this is not true in today's scenario and you really don't need to use the command line for your day-to-day -day activities or even if you have to work with the server settings and everything else. The GUI is powerful enough. We have a lot of good interfaces and everything. Almost all your work can be done through the GUI. You don't need to leave the graphical interface, go into the command line and do something special from there. So why people keep on saying that you need to learn the command line? Well, the command line is a way to get accustomed to the operating system in a better manner. If you really plan to go ahead and be an advanced user in Linux, then I would recommend learning the command line more and more. Of course, these sessions will come up in our series where we'll be looking at the command line and I promise you, I'm going to make these things as easy as possible for you. But for the time being, don't worry, we don't need to jump into the command line. We will be working with the graphical interface and for the time being, all the things that you need are available in the graphical interface. Before we proceed further ahead, I would like to give you a basic overview of how an operating system looks like when you have installed it on a computer. It's a layered approach and we would like to know where exactly we are working when we are on the operating system. That may give you a comfort level of working with the operating system. So the first thing that you have is the hardware, okay? This hardware runs on electricity, fine. On top of your hardware is the technical or the main actual operating system which we refer as the kernel. On top of the kernel to interact with it, there is usually a shell. This shell, in general, people refer it to as a command line interface. Whenever the term shell comes up, people assume it's a command line interface. But a shell is a covering which lets you interact with the actual operating system or the kernel in an easier manner. Okay, So it is not necessary, the shell has to be a command line interface. Your shell could be the graphical interface also. Fine. So 
In general, in most of the cases, people might draw another circle and they might put your GUI over here. Fine. But my preference is usually I will say shell or GUI over here. In today's scenario, this is much more suitable because as soon as your system starts, it starts into a GUI. And we directly work with the GUI, the GUI shell, the graphical shell, you can refer it as. So, if you keep your minds open, it's a concept how you are interacting with the operating system. It is not that shell is different or the command line interface is different and the graphical interface is different. It's just another two different ways how you interact with the system. Uh, probably nowadays uh, you use a lot of new devices where you are just interacting them with the voice. So the shell, there is no graphics, no command, nothing. You are just interacting with that. Right? So it, it's just a voice based shell that you are using. So if you keep your minds open, if you are ready to accept things, it will be much more easier for you to go ahead in your Linux journey. Now, after this shell that is there, what, what we use in our day-to-day -day lives are the applications. Like you use the web browser, your office suit, so this, this layer where you are actually working are all the applications. You don't even actually use the GUI directly in most of the cases. So, this is where you are actually located as a happy user who really don't need to worry about the intricacies of how these things work. You will be able to do all your work comfortably in this particular zone. So, believe me, it's not going to be really difficult for you at all working with the Linux system. Okay, so next thing that I would like to talk about is the file system structure or the file system organization. Uh, what I mean by that is you have already worked on a particular operating system where there has been a hierarchy and structure of files, folders and directories. And when you start working on the Linux system, you get to see a lot of files and directories. Now, this can be overwhelming in the beginning and it usually pops up a question, what all these things are, do I really need to know these? So, initially, you really don't need to worry about all these things. I will show you the structure, how the file system looks like. We will have a small discussion about it. And I will just point out that which parts are going to be important for you right now. So, this is a rough example of what the files and directories that you are going to see on a Linux system. Now, obviously, you are not going to see any C colon, D colon or things uh, which you would have seen in your operating system, earlier operating system. Over here, the whole Linux system is represented under a file system tree structure where the top level is called as the root represented by a slash. This we refer as the root. Okay. Under this, everything on your computer that is there, your hardware devices, other partitions, your data, content, everything is displayed here. Later on, we'll learn a concept that Linux type of system shows or represents everything as a file. And that is why what makes it so interesting and useful to work with. So, the root is the top level one. You are going to see things like bin, sbin, boot, root, exit, etc, 10, home, var, srv, lost and found and few other things over there. This is how the Linux system organizes its content by putting them in a defined file hierarchy system. Fine. So, right now, you really don't need to get into all the details of this. What you need to understand is where you will be working as a user. 
So as a user, every user has provided his or her special directory. This directory is called as the user's home, where the user will keep their content. By content, I mean you might be writing some uh, notes, you might be creating some documents, you might be doing image editing, you might be making videos, you might be doing graphical work, you might be downloading something. All these things you are allowed to keep in only one directory, and that directory is usually same as your login name which is placed under the home directory so under root you have this home directory and inside home let us say your login name is dexter right so this is going to be my home directory so my home directory is home slash dexter and anything Whatever I download, create, make, modify stays inside this directory. I'm not allowed to keep or write to any other place as a generic user. So this is what you need to remember if you're facing any problems while saving files or something. Most probably you are not saving it inside your home directory. This is the first point that you have to get into your mind for easy working with the Linux system. The second place which you might need to access sometimes, not necessarily, sometimes when you download something, they might go into a directory called as temp. Fine. Temp is a temporary location of the operating system. It keeps temporary files over there. So sometimes some of your files may land up over there. So you may have to look into temp and this is also an area where you can write it. But it is not a safe location, contents get, may get deleted from there. So what I am trying to say is, you can write here, you can use this as a temporary area. Okay. Apart from this, right now you really don't need to worry about anything else that is displayed over here. Fine. Now, I will compare this for your understanding with the Windows operating system, how it looks. In case of Windows, usually you have this, uh, in the graphical interface, you, have, you are shown with a My Computer icon, right? Under the My Computer icon, you are shown C colon, D colon, then lot of other things. That means whole computer representation starts from My Computer icon, Similarly, you can say in Linux, the whole computer representation starts from the root. So, where are these C colon D colons? These are available in a special directory under MNT. Under MNT, there could be some subdirectories showing giving you access to these partitions of Windows if exist or any other partitions from other operating systems if you have installed multiple operating systems. Nowadays, newer ones, if you are on the graphical interface, you really don't need to worry about it. You will be shown the list of all these partitions and when you click, they will get auto-mounted. What is mounting is the technical term used here when you try to access a partition. The partition contents are made available under a directory. Right? As I said, there is no C colon, D colon. The partition contents will be made available under subdirectories. So if you connect a pen drive or click on these partitions, depending upon the distribution you are using, the Linux distribution, instead of MNT probably, for most, in most of the cases, the removable media like pen drive, it gets mounted under media. Okay? Media slash something, something, and the content of that device is accessible from that point. So if you want to copy something back to your pen drive, you will actually copy it inside this directory. And before you, when you eject your pen drive, your contents will get written into the pen drive. So another point to get into your mind is you are not going to get to see C colon D colon. Right? These things will be accessible under some directories. Again, what I'm trying to explain this just to get an understanding of it. In the graphical interface, you will not really need to bother about it. 
but later on in any case we will be talking about these points in details next linux is a multi user system of course you can have multiple users on windows also but i am not going to get into that details multi user system means there can be multiple users now when there are multiple users you need to have a administrator in linux there are two types of users the administrator who is referred as root and a generic user any user that you create on the system so what is the difference between the root user the generic user well the root user's login id is root who is all powerful on the system and this user has all the privileges on the system with this user you you can add remove software manage your users manage this quota basically the root can do each and everything on the system second type of users are generic users generic users are users who are going to use the system for day to day activities like browsing using applications office suits and other things these are generic users these users do not have too much of access right that means they can't even install software fine right? so what happens is if you are using a linux system you don't log in and work as group all the time you always create two, two users and you always work as a generic user only when some administrative task is required you switch to the root account or administrative privileges and do the work and immediately log out of that this way the chances of damaging your system by mistake becomes very less as a generic user you will not be able to make changes to your system so always work as a generic user and the other user is going to be root now in certain distributions instead of root being enabled what is done is the first user that we create on the system are given pseudo administrative rights there is a pseudo subsystem with which we can fine grain certain access rights uh, but that later on so in these kind of distributions the first user that is created gets the administrative rights now you would say this is going to break what i just said well no it's not like that whenever you are working or logged in as that user all your activities are run as a generic user but as soon as you try to run a administrative command you will be asked for the password again so by mistake also you cannot run a administrative command it has to be intentional so the first user has equivalent administrative rights but he will he or she will have to run it under the pseudo administrative privileges usually on the command line every administrative command by this particular user is appended by sudo sudo something fine and then you are asked for your own password to run this particular administrative command on the graphical interface in most of the cases the graph uh, the graphical interface will automatically ask you for the password then only the administrative command will run so whatever mechanism you use either you have the root based interface means your root is enabled or you are using the sudo thing always work as the generic user and don't log in as administrator all the time now some people don't like the sudo mechanism they always like to work with root so they can enable the root by setting up the root password i'm not going to get into the details right now because that will come when we go to the command line interface and other kind of administrative work things for the time being we will be just working with the uh, interface which is in most of the cases uh, sudo based in any case in a graphical interface even if sudo is not there root is enabled you will still be asked for the root password automatically so really you don't need to worry about this but i just wanted to clarify what are the 
these three different things in the system. The other last point that I would like to add into this is the directory. If root is enabled, this directory is the home directory for the root user. Anyways, you will not be accessing this much directly, but just for your information, I wanted to add this. Okay, so for the last part of the video, I would like to discuss about the file names. The file names that you can keep and what are allowed, this is going to help you while you are working with the operating system. First thing, let us just have a look at what characters we should simply avoid or should not use. Well, these are all the special characters that are there you should avoid in the file names. You may be able to create a file name but then you can get a lot of errors. So the best thing is to avoid all these things in your file name. That is dollar asterisk, exclamation mark. Basically most of the characters that are there on the top line above the numbers, they should be simply avoided. What things you can use in the file name when you are creating? All the alphabets, lowercase and uppercase, the numerical digits 0 to 9, hyphen or minus symbol, underscore, dot and space. My personal thing is that you should not use space in the file names. This is for people who are going to work on the command line you will come to know how space in file names can give you a lot of trouble. So it would be a best practice just to avoid space but you can still have it. That is not a problem. So it's just a advice that will be useful for you later on. Another important thing that you need to really understand is the file names are case sensitive. What I mean by case sensitive is that if you have a file A, B, C, this file is not equal to A, B, C. That means these are two different files. If you create a file A, B, C, it will be a different file. That means any change in the name of even a single character, uppercase or lowercase, it will be considered as a different file. So A, B, C is different than A, B, C which is different than A, B, C, A, B, C or wherever even a small change is there that will be a different file. File, file names in Linux or the Linux kernel as, as such does not bother about extensions. We don't have the extension as a separate thing in the file name. So your extension is essentially the part of the file name. This becomes important for people who are going to work on the command line. So whenever you try to access a file through the command line, you have to give the complete name. In the graphical interface, you are usually clicking on the file name. So it really doesn't matter much, but it's very important to understand there's no concept of extensions. The last four characters or three characters after the dot are just for representation purpose or for the help of the graphical interface. Nothing more than that. So if you have a file called as help.pdf, fine. This is just an indicator part saying that this is a PDF file. It makes it easier for you to understand what kind of file it is. Though technically it's an actual PDF file which was generated by some application. So Linux does not really bother about it. These are for your help and this is the full file name. File names can have a lot of dots in between them which is allowed. So a dot b dot c dot pdf is completely open. Fine. Now I would like to add one more thing before I leave because I know you are going to experiment and someone will eventually create a file something like that. You might ask it. I make a file like a dot b dot c and then when you do this you will not see it. Well any file or directory that starts with a dot is a hidden file. Fine. So these will not be visible directly 
they will be there in the directory you will if you are using a file manager you will have to say show hidden files and these will start showing up so uh, just keep this last point in mind if you want to hide put a dot in front of you simple uh, i'll ask you to explore the system more we'll meet in the next video thanks for watching